Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins, and welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and medium, and here we explore life, death, consciousness, and what it all means. Today, I have Pierre Predivand on the show. A true world citizen, Pierre has labored a great deal of his life for social justice, living in or visiting 40 countries on every continent. From his Geneva home, Pierre is now active as a writer, speaker, and workshop facilitator, helping people to live simpler, yet richer, more contented lives. His workshops provide personal development tools that empower attendees to strengthen their internal anchors and advance on their spiritual path. Pierre is also an independent celebrant for weddings, burials, and other events. His new book, 365 Blessings, is out now. Welcome to the show, Pierre. Thank you, Amy. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to thank you all for your continuing support of the show and for passing forward my podcast. My podcast has grown only because of my listeners. So I just want to give you a moment to tell you how much I appreciate you and what you have done for me to help me grow. And I'm excited to say that I am now a featured creator on Fireside. Fireside is an app that allows the audience to be part of the process. So I will be hosting shows over on Fireside where you can listen live to the show. You can also ask questions of the guests. If you find me on Instagram at Dr. Amy Robbins, you can link to my Fireside bio there and you'll be able to download Download the app through that. Also, if you haven't subscribed to my newsletter yet, please do so at dramyrobbins.com. I'm going to be switching to bi weekly uh, newsletters, so you won't be getting them weekly anymore, but you will be getting bi weekly newsletters with my soul wisdom and other fun tidbits that I'm going to bring to you all. So go ahead, follow me on Instagram find me on Fireside. You will also still be able to hear your podcasts as you are used to listening to them on Apple or Spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts. But Fireside gives you the opportunity to listen live with me. So I would love to have you come join me over there. DM me if you have any questions. And thanks again for your continued support. So let's get started with your book. Yes. And your book is about blessings, and you yes. include 365 of them in your book. But yes. can, you, can you start with the sentiment that led you on this journey, which was bless those who curse you? Well, how, yes. How it's, do you do that? Well, let, let me first explain how I got involved in this. Okay. In the early 80s, I was working for a group of Swiss NGOs, non-governmental organizations, starting a new program for schools on third world issues at that time. That was over 40 years ago. Nobody was speaking about the third world in Swiss schools and in, in other schools in Europe, neither. And I was very excited by my job. I invested myself totally in it. I lived some some uh, distance away from the office. I didn't have a car, so I had a camp bed in my office. And when I, was, when I missed the last train at night, well, I would sleep in the office. And I wanted to start a, a roving exhibit for schools on hunger. And the name of this, this exhibit was Ending Hunger Today. Mm. And... Uh, uh, the, my sponsors said, look, Pierre, there's no money in our budget. You, we have to drop the idea. And I took the equivalent today of in, in purchasing power, at least twenty five to $30,000 out of my own savings to organize this exhibit, which was a great success. It went around schools and 
I went to schools to give talks related to this. And the press even spoke about this. And I, this wasn't theory for me because I've lived 11 years in Africa. And when I was in the Sahel, I was one of the co-founders of what became the largest grassroots peasant organization, in other words, small farmers in the whole of Africa. We had hundreds of thousands of members. And uh, after leaving Africa, I kept a close contact with some of these organizations. And one of them had as its slogan, ending hunger by the year 2000. And this was also the slogan of a world campaign against hunger that started in the States in the 70s called The Hunger Project. And they were constantly speaking about ending hunger by the year 2000. And if there had been a real political will, this would have been possible. And the aim of the project, of the campaign, was to stir up this political will in the populations. But uh, one of the guys in the organization sponsoring my work just det detested my guts. He hated my guts. I never knew why, mm -hmm. because I had, for many, many years, had very cordial relations with him. And I think it, it, became, it was due because he discovered I told him once that I got up, got up at 4.30 in the morning to meditate. And he considered this completely crazy. How could a guy get up and meditate at 4.30? And from this day onwards, his attitude changed completely. And then he, um, he convened a meeting of the four sponsoring organizations with the aim of getting me out of my job. Mm. Just because of his personal detestation of my my person, my person, hmm. and uh, I had, they had stopped. I had um, stopped speaking of this world campaign against hunger. And these are organisations which are fighting hang hunger in the third world, and they were forbidding me to speak about. Ending hunger. I mean, this is insane. Mm -hmm. But I, con I continued using the slogan, uh, the end of hunger for the year 2000, because one of the grassroots peasant organizations in Africa, with which I had a very close contact, had exactly the same slogan as their slogan. So I thought, well, if grassroots African farmers have this slogan, themselves it's certainly one a good one that i can use in my work and i was convened to this meeting by this for these four organizations and it was so strange because the the guy who re led this meeting who concocted this whole project against myself said he opened the meeting this is a business meeting by saying i am an atheist and that had nothing to do with the aim of the meeting. Mm -hmm. There were no no minutes taken, nothing. It was completely illegal, if you can say. And they said, and he'd convinced his colleagues, and he had a very strong personality, that they had to agree that either that they would put me in front, they would confront me with the statement, either you stop saying hunger, can be ended by the year 2000 in schools because the American Hunger Project says it, or you quit your job. And they discussed between themselves and said, knowing Pierre's integrity, if we put him in front of this alternative, keeping his job, but no longer using the slogan, or quitting, he will quit. And so we will not even have to pay him any compensation. And that's what they did. Mm. They put me in front of this, this alternative. Either you stop saying you can end hunger by the year 2000 or you quit your job. Well, I took two, three days to think over it. And evidently, Amy, I gave up my job. 
I didn't want to sacrifice my deepest convictions and integrity just to keep my job. But in the weeks following, I developed such anger, mm. even such really, really deep, deep resentment against especially this guy. And you know, resentment is like a, a rat which is gnawing, gnawing at your entrails. It's horrible feeling. Mm -hmm. It's horrible feeling, resentment. And I was meditating and praying and leading, also reading all sorts of texts to try to get rid of this, but it dragged on week after week, month after month. I was getting desperate. And then one morning, reading the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' statement, bless those who curse you. Mm. Of course, Pierre, it's so simple. You just have to bless them. And there and then, Amy, I started blessing these people in their joy, in their health, in their work, in their abundance, in their family relations, in every conceivable way. So First you just thing. like made a quick a shift, like I'm just going to like send love to them, or what does blessing look like? Yes, the blessing for me is sending focused love to people or groups. So I started doing this. First, it was in the head mm -hmm. to obey what I believe was a revealed commandment, but then it came down to the heart, Amy, because blessing is. 100% heart energy. And then suddenly, three months later, something amazing happened. I started blessing people in the street, in the supermarket, on the bus, everywhere. And I used to take the, and it became such a joy. I used to take the train quite often. And I would walk the distance of the whole train both ways to just bless every single person. Like out loud, you would bless them, or no, just no, in no, your head? No, no, of course not. No, okay. no, <laughs> it was always in silence in the heart. Always. Gotcha. I, I've only it's only in weddings or burials that I bless people out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Because I know, I know what it looks like in Chicago when people are walking up and down the trains, blessing people. So that's why I was getting clarification. Uh -huh. Oh no, no, no! That was strictly. <laughs> inside my heart and this became so amazing and I had some amazing healings of incredibly difficult situations just by blessing I remember for instance I had an African friend uh, who had a uh, he had an afro-american orchestra with with the uh, black musicians and um, there were about a dozen of them, and he'd organize a co quite successful concerts, and he offered to organize a concert in a large uh, concert hall, to the, the money of which, all the profits of which would go to ending hunger, to fighting hunger. And I thought this was wonderful, and I went to see the, it was in a large school, very large college, college, I went to see the college director who said, uh, yes, okay, you can have the, the, the hall for this such and such a price. And just you check with the, the concierge, what you hate, call this, the person who takes care, the caretaker mm -hmm. school uh, for the practical organization. And I went to see the caretaker and he was so hostile. I couldn't believe it. But we'd, we fixed for the date and the, and the time, and he couldn't say no because he wasn't the, the director of the college, but he was very antipathetic. And my friend and I came two hours before the concert to check that all the mics were in order and everything was okay. And there were only three mics on the scene. So evidently this fellow had taken off some of the mics away. And my friend said, Pierre, I can't have a an orchestra with 12 musicians and singers and three mics. And so we went to see the caretaker and he was so hostile. He was, there was a sort of little desk 
between him and my friend and I. And he was just so aggressive. And first of all, I felt a great tension. And, and my little voice said, Pierre, you're not going to solve this problem by anger. Just start blessing him. And Amy, I just started blessing him in his health, in his joy, in his family relationships, in his abundance, in every conceivable way. And in between two sentences, suddenly his whole face lit up. He gave a beautiful smile and said, OK, I'll fetch the nut mics you need. He came with the, back with a pile of mics, recommended the best ones, and the, super, and the concert was a super success. And I could mul multiply examples like this, sometimes instantaneous healings of situation just through blessing the person from the heart. And that means really feeling, feeling the words you say, not just saying them, feeling them. So what if you don't feel compassion towards someone or you don't feel like you feel angry at them? How do you shift that to move to a place of being able to bless them? Well, I love the statement made by Mary Baker Eddy, who was a French, uh, sorry, an American writer and uh, spiritual healer of the last century. And she said, a deep sincerity is sure of success, but God takes care of it. If you are deeply sincere and you really wish to overcome this anger, you just give it up and say, look, whatever you call the, the, the person up there on the first floor, father or intelligence or universal mind, whatever you call it, I can't manage this situation alone. Please help me overcome this anger. And if you are sincere and if you persevere, it will happen. Because a deep sincerity is sure of success, hmm. God takes care of it. It seems so very simple. Amy, it is. That's why I so love it. You know, I wrote a doctorate of almost a 900 page doctorate with almost a thousand quotations. Uh, I prepared it at the University of Michigan and got it from huh, La Sorbonne. Okay, in, in Ann Arbor, and I got it from La Sorbonne in the 70s, which at the time was the, the best French university. And you know, Amy, I threw away the last copy of my doctorate 25 years ago because it seemed to me so vain and so unnecessary. Mm. I take no pride at it, and I never tell anybody in the States that I have a doctorate, whereas people are always saying, Mr. Mrs. So, Mrs. So, so and so, PhD. And it's just not necessary. Jesus said, if you do not become as little children, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God, it's not a, a special uh, five-star hotel in heaven. It's that inner place inside each one of us of infinite abundance, unlimited peace, constant joy that each one can access when he wants. And again, if you do not become as little children, you will not enter the kingdom of God. So, so what do you say to people who are now adults? Like when you say, if you do not become as little children, what do you mean by that? And how does well, someone who... Amy, that's a very good question. It's evidently a metaphor. What Jesus meant was, don't complicate life. Don't use complex theological explanations. It doesn't touch people. You know, I studied theology before studying sociology. Hmm. My father was General Secretary of the World Presbyterian Alliance, which assembled, gathered all Presbyterian or Reformed churches around the world. And so I can, you can say I, I was really inoculated with official religion. <laughs> mm. 
and it wasn't it didn't feed my soul mm -hmm. and I was for many years I was on on a path of not knowing where I was going and then I discovered my own spiritual path as a matter of fact, my next book I, I just handed the manuscript to my publisher here in, in Switzerland will be how to find your spiritual path and I'm immediately going to start translating it into English because I have an American friend who really wants to find, find a publisher for the book in, in the States. So, Can you give us a sneak peek? How do you find your spiritual path? Well, the whole book is based on the concept of integrity. Ah. I, I wrote at the I beginning. I love that. At the beginning of my, I started my workshops 30 years ago. Almost 30, 29, it's in, a, in a few months it'll be 30 years ago. And the basic text for all my workshops is this text on integrity. And as a matter of fact, I gave a weekend uh, workshop just the last weekend and distributed this text. Because for me, it's the foundation stone of any life. And so I base. I, I say, your spiritual search must be 100% based on being truthful to yourself, mm. to your deepest desire, to your, you know, be truthful to your integrity. If your inner voice tells you, look, Pierre, this path is not for you, well, you'll have to leave it. I was for, for, almost 40 years on a very narrow spiritual path. It was very efficient in terms of spiritual healing. That's why I stayed so long. But it was incredibly restricted and rejected all other teachings. And this was killing me. It was against my own integrity. And uh, as the British say, I must have been a slow learner because I took... <laughs> 35 years to discover this, but what counts is the result. And, and so what, do you think, what do you think gets in the way of people being able to live in their own integrity? Well, I think, like, for instance, I was brought up in a very authoritarian religion, and fear was an important element of this. As, as alas, alas, in a lot of Christian teachings, when you... When you go through through history, the history of the, for instance, Christianity, Jesus was a non-dual thinker. You know, I and the Father are one. There wasn't God one side and you the other side. Mm -hmm. If I can say to Jesus, we are God smiling on the earth, totally one with God. And this this fellow called St. Augustine in the third century invented this completely crazy theory of original sin. It was an invention of St. Augustine. It was nothing to do with what Jesus had taught. He'd never spoken about original sin ever. And this was a tool, became, this became a tool to keep people subdued by fear, and that if they left the fold, that was a major sin, and they would be punished. Mm -hmm. I've studied this quite in depth. There's a, an amazing French historian who wrote an amazing study called, it doesn't exist the last in English, Péché et peur au Moyen-Âge, Fear and uh, Sin in Medieval Ages. And uh, this is such an amazing compendium, some of these crazy teachings. And all these teachings were patriarchal. They were concocted in the brain of male theologians. Mm -hmm. For me, that is very important, that the, the churches, including the Protestant one, the Calvinist one I was brought up, in were strictly patriarchal and uh, 
This gave a very hard note, harsh note, to the teaching. But Jesus was a, a gentle man, a man of joy and abundance and incredible forgiveness. And so, this is a spirit of real blessing for me. So how do you, oh, I'm sorry. Go. Yes, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask, how do you differentiate a blessing from prayer or a gratitude practice? Like, what do you see as the differences or is there no well, no difference? Oh, absolutely. There's a huge difference. I'm going mm. to shock you, Amy. Okay. I, I never pray in the traditional sense of praying. I never ask God for anything because at the end of the uh, chapter 15 of the Gospel according to St. Luke, the famous parable of the prodigal son. Do you remember that parable? It's a story of no, two brothers. No, because I'm Jewish, so I've never read it. Oh, sorry. Yet. So the, <laughs> this is a story of who, two brothers living with their, their father, and the younger brother asks his father his, for his part of the inheritance, and he runs off into the world and makes big parties with prostitutes and squanders all his inheritance and end up, he ends up as a, a, as a, as a laborer, feeding, taking care of pigs, and for the Jews, you know, to take care of pigs was about the last job you could ever do. And he thought, one day he thought, well, I'll go back to my father's home. At least there I can work as a, as a laborer in his fields, and at least I'll be fed and and housed decently. And he, he goes home and it's said that the father was waiting for him. And that's amazing when one knows the oriental culture. Uh, and the father ran out to his son and welcomed him with such warmth. He tell his, tells his servants, organize a big party. This, my son who is lost is found. And he puts on the sun a white robe, which indicates innocence, and a ring on his finger, which signifies oneness, re-established. Mm -hmm. And there's a big party. And the, 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 the his elder brother was working in the fields, and he comes back and he hears, he hears all this music and this dancing and this feasting, and he asks the servants, what on earth is happening? And the servants say, oh, your, your brother has come back. And the father has, has organized a celebration to celebrate his return. And the elder brother is just hopping mad. And he refuses to go to the party. But the father comes out and says, you know, he complains and says, I've worked for you all these years and I never even organized a party for my friends. And here you organize this party for this, this son of yours who squandered your, 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 his inheritance with prostitutes. And the father has for me what is the most amazing statement I've read in the world spiritual literature, you know, I've studied Buddhism and Hinduism and many religions. And uh, by the way, the only one I feel in, in, in link with are the Quakers, but we'll speak about that later, later. And the father had this amazing statement. My son, thou art always with me. And all that I have is thine. And that's the essential statement of a non-dual religion, a non-dual belief, a non-dual practice, that we are already one. Mm. Source of infinite abundance. We are God smiling on the earth, Amy. So praying to God is separating you from God. Exactly. You've got it. All I, my, all my prayers are thank you. Thank you for my perfect health. If I'm not feeling well, 
I start saying thank you for my perfect health, because that is the ultimate reality of my being. So blessing, so so blessings are similar to gratitude. It sounds like. Well, if you read the book, it they can take the form, uh, not of a request, but they there are major. I would say they are just statements of spiritual, a certain spiritual reality statement, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, but there's a lot of gratitude in the essence of blessing. I'd mm-hmm. say the, the core essence of blessing is gratitude. Mm-hmm. So can you just, we have to wrap up in just a moment, but can you leave us with what is your favorite blessing in the book? Oh, my dear, my dear, dear, Amy, you are asking an impos- almost impossible question. <laughs> For me, blessing is so universal. But I would say, for readers of the book, not for myself, but blessing yourself is so important. There are quite a few blessings for yourself in the book. And this has been completely left out by the churches and traditional religion. But how can you give to others what you first don't give to yourself? So Mm -hmm. bless yourself abundantly. I just look at your face, Amy, and I bless the infinite beauty that I see inside you that just radiates through your whole being. I say thank you, thank you, thank you. This wonderful reflection of the divine reminding me who I am. Mm. Just God smiling on the earth. Wow. And I want to so thank you for this interview. You've done me such a lot of good. You brought me such joy. Speaking of one of my very favorite topics, by the way, I was I mentioned the Quakers. The Quakers are the only spiritual or religious group I feel in harmony with. And I've I started going again to the Quaker meeting in Geneva, which I attended or when I was a young student uh, 50 years ago. And I love it because it's just silent. Occasionally someone gets up and says a few words, but the rest is silent. And that is for me the essence of prayer. It's not asking something. Mm. It's listening to what the Godhead is saying to us minute after minute. My child, thou art always with me and all that I have is thine. Well, what a beautiful way to end. Thank you so much, Pierre, for sharing your yourself, your wisdom and your blessings with us. If people are interested, where can they find your information and your book and your teachings? And Well, I have a, I have a website on blessing. That would be a good start. I'll give the address www.gentleartofblessing, all linked, gentleartofblessing.org. And I, I'd uh, like to stipulate that I, I don't keep, I don't organize the, the website. We have a, I have a wonderful friend, Jane, uh, Jane Young, who the webmaster and a very dear friend in New Hampshire, Manuela Meyer, who gets a lot of, assembles a lot of the material for the website. So I'm privileged to work with these two wonderful women. And it seems as this website is doing good. And there are some, some rather striking stories of healing, mm. whole section on healing. Wow. Blessing. Well, thank you so much. I am going to keep your book, The Blessings, in your book and use them. And I'm just so grateful for you taking the time today to speak with us and educate us about blessings. Well, Amy, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to just pour from my heart because as you felt, everything I've said 
as you can from the heart. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Wondering what comes next and what it all means? Head over to Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you get your podcasts and hit subscribe. Also, if you could take a minute to rate and review my podcast, I would really appreciate it. Stay tuned as we continue to explore life, death, and the space between.